Welcome to Discovery Watch with John Kaiser. I'm your host, Jim Goddard. Welcome back to the show, John. Jim, it's a pleasure to be back. John, Eagle Plains announced results for the Vulcan drilling program today, but the stock dropped. Was there anything positive about the results? The results were both positive and negative, but not in the positive manner that the market wanted. Eagle Plains drilled two holes for 977 meters into the Vulcan target, which is in southeastern British Columbia, and it's a Sullivan II zinc lead silver type type target. The first hole uh, they drilled at 590 meters, and it was aimed at a shallow magnetotelluric anomaly, which turned out to be a gabbroic intrusion that had seams of graphite in it, which explained the conductivity of the target. And it's kind of unusual because this, these, these gabbro intrusions are known for this part of the uh, for, uh, uh, southeastern British Columbia, but nobody's ever seen that they would have these graphite seams to make them conductive. So that clearly was a false target. Now, they drilled a, the primary purpose of this program, however, was not to get lucky with a single hole, but to prove a concept that uh, Tim Tremondi and his team have developed about the Vulcan Corridor, namely that uh, all the historic work in the past decades has been based on a misunderstanding of where the contact is between the, the middle and the lower Aldrich formations. And the Sullivan deposit sits right at the contact, at the base of middle middle Aldrich. So everybody assumes that that's going to be the place where uh, all the activity took place in the Purcell Basin and where you're going to find uh, similar smoker systems. And the thinking was, well, because they had misplaced it several hundred meters um, to the east, most of the drilling had overshot the potential area where such a deposit could be. So the primary purpose of this program was to show that, uh, yes, the, the LMC line is farther to the west, which means that the entire corridor is still prospective for these uh, Sullivan-type uh, CDEX deposits. So the second hole, they... They, the first hole, they, they realized, uh, well, the target's kind of a bit to the east of where they think the LMC line is. So they, they decided, well, let's not drill a super deep hole so that we're killing two birds with one stone. So let's drill a shorter hole, take care of this anomaly, and then do a second hole, a shallower hole, which they only drilled to 380 meters. And that clearly identified the LMC line. The, their hypothesis is correct. Uh, they did some downhole geophysics and uh, looking sideways, they don't see anything. They did intersect alt alteration in the uh, in the lower Aldrich formation, which is kind of what you want to see, but no uh, sulfides of any consequence. Uh, so in terms of finding a zinc lead silver SEDEX deposit, uh, this is a bust, but they now realize based on the logging that they are at the southern limit of the system. If there is a SEDEX system, it's towards the north. And that's, uh, that's the, that's uh, the good news is it's, there's something there. But the bad news is towards the north, it becomes mountainous, much more expensive and difficult to explore. So they've accomplished their goal of upping the prospectivity of the Balkan corridor. They're now not likely to spend any more of their own money. This program probably only costs a couple hundred thousand dollars. It's, uh, so the next step in the prospect generator farm out model where you have to collect some third dimension data in the form of drilling in order to be able to market the farm out to the project. So they'll probably be looking at the type of producers that are interested in exploring for a zinc lead silver deposit. They also use the, uh, the update as an excuse to tell people about the pine channel deposit prospect and pine channels in northern Saskatchewan and they, Eagle Plains, uh, it is a prospect generator company which has a number of projects in northern Saskatchewan and in uh, and, and, and there's also northern uh, Manitoba. And this whole area is now being sort of reinterpreted for its high-grade gold quartz vein potential. Uh, there's a company called SKRR Exploration, which which is a new company. It's headed by Ron Natalitsky, uh, uh, Ross McElroy, and Sherman Dahl. It, it's it's uh, just in the process of raising additional money. 
They've optioned the Olson Lake project from Eagle Plains, and they've also optioned the Leland project from the Eagle Plains spin-out Taiga Gold Corp., uh, which uh, is Fisher JV is under option to uh, SSR uh, as hopefully future feed for the Santoya CD, CD project. Now, this whole area is being given a fresh look, led by Ron Adolitsky, who's calling this the, the Trans-Hudson Corridor. And Ron and uh, Tim's father, uh, Bob Termundi, actually uh, uh, worked in the Santoy area, and Tim likes to joke uh, that the two of them managed to not find, uh, find the Santoy deposit. So in some sense, this is unfinished business. And this, this uh, Pine Channel prospect, it's been known about since 2014, uh, there's been 90 holes drilled into it, uh, mostly shallow, less than uh, 100 meters, and many of them with a winky drill. It has very high-grade gold, up to uh, 30 ounces per ton. It's, it's nuggety, but it's erratic quartz veins, and nobody has ever been able to put anything together. But what they're doing is interesting. They're going in there with a you know mapping prospecting program, but they're doing also a uh, drone um, magnetic survey. And the purpose of this is uh, is to be able to figure out what, is, what are the structural orientations of these different zones, and the magnetics will reveal this. But what's completely new is being able to fly these uh, surveys on 10-meter spacing, which was not possible with the old fixed-wing surveys, and it provides a much greater degree of granularity. So it's like a, an entirely new data set made possible by the drone revolution that these guys are going to collect and make part of their prospecting and mapping. And the idea is to to sort out all these old showings, see what controls there are, and, and maybe put together targets where a drill program can actually put together zones that could become a future mine, rather than all these random holes coming up with high grade here and nothing there and, and nothing ever hanging together. So that's just one of the things that Eagle Plains is going to be uh, focusing on this uh, this this uh, summer. Uh, it's a uh, spin-out company, Tiger Gold Corp. Uh, it's um, awaiting to see how the Alisar uh, SSR merger plays out in terms of what the new company is going to do with regard to that joint venture where SSR continues to spend. Uh, and Tiger itself has come under pressure because uh, a nine-cent financing uh, $2 million financing done in February, came free trading a week ago. So now we have the usual uh, clip and flip uh, happening out there, not helped by the fact that uh, after uh, uh, almost insane, uh, it wasn't even V-shaped anymore, it was like a vertical uh, rally in the, in the general markets. Uh, today we're having a bad day as the world uh, contemplates uh, Jerome Powell's uh, predictions that will be two years before we have any hope of um, being out of this uh, economic uh, mess and employment uh, anywhere near normal. At the same time as we're seeing upticks in uh, in, in COVID-19 infections uh, uh, in North America and also surging to new levels in places such as uh, Africa. So not a particularly good day to put out uh, news that uh, uh, target people hoped could be uh, worth a couple billion dollar Sullivan uh, two clone uh, um, it's, uh, but Eagle Plains back to its valuation as a prospect generator. So it was kind of a free lunch for those who bought it, uh, once and a half ago in the hope that they would get lucky with that one hole on that target. We'll have more with John Kaiser right after this. Engineer Gold Mines is focused on the exploration and development of the historic high-grade Engineer Gold Mine situated 32 kilometers southwest of Atlan, British Columbia. Engineer Gold Mines is fully permitted for surface and underground exploration with the drill program now underway. Engineer Gold Mines Limited trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol EAU. For more information, please visit us at engineergoldmines.com. Cypress Development Corp. is developing a world-class lithium resource in the heart of Clayton Valley, Nevada. The size of the resource makes the Clayton Valley project a premier asset with the potential to impact the future of lithium supply. Cypress Development Corp. trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol CYP, the OTCQB, symbol CYDVF, and on Frankfurt, symbol C1Z1. For more information, please visit our website, cypressdevelopmentcorp.com. 
Welcome back. We're chatting with John Kaiser. John, Renaissance Gold just announced a merger of equals with Evram Resources. What does this mean for the Nevada Prospect Generator? It's going to change completely uh, how one looks at this company. Renaissance Gold is one of my uh, favorites. Uh, it has a very hardcore uh, prospect generator farm out model. Uh, it never drills its own projects. It just does all the, the field work to, and, and, and sort of geological thinking to dress up a target and then present it to farm outs. And it's been remarkably successful in getting farm outs to entities such as Hochschild. The deals have not been particularly strong. And it's been disappointing to see these groups uh, drill a few holes into these prospects uh, and then hand them back to the company, uh, tainting them uh, for 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 future farm outs. So Renaissance Gold, uh, you know, it's been hard for me to really put my finger on any particular project as something that I'm holding my breath on. We we, we talked uh, earlier about Eagle Plains and its Vulcan. Uh, I prefer it when a prospect generator periodically picks one of its projects to do a little bit of extra work to it because they've dressed up a target where for at least a little while you can dream of hitting it out of the park. Now, Everin Resources uh, is also a prospect generator, and uh, and its chairman is Paul Van Eden, and its CEO is Patty Nickel, and it's been focused on Canada and Mexico, and it's ended up the, uh, have, uh, accumulating a few royalties, uh, they raised a whole bunch of money, about seven and a half million bucks a couple of years ago from Newmont based on a project in Mexico where I had wonderful samples on surface. But once you drill beneath it, uh, it vanished and that was, uh, the stock, you know, plunged from a dollar fifty all the way back to thirty cents where so it's been sort of, um, you know, crawling along as, as a bottom fish uh, type company. Now in this merger of equals, uh, because of the different numbers of shares out and, and pricing, uh, uh, Evren will, shareholders will each receive one share of Orogen royalties and the Renaissance Gold shareholders will receive 1.2248 shares of Orogen. And as you can tell from the, the name Orogen royalties, it is turning into a different type of prospect generator farm out company. The, the, the Patty Nickel will remain a CEO and and Paul will remain as chairman. Bob Felder will step into the role of president and continue to run the Nevada exploration effort. Um, that's going to be a bit complicated because because uh, uh, all the project uh, uh, Everm itself doesn't really have any projects in Nevada. But in 2018, they did a deal with Yamana which gave it access to its uh, Western uh, U.S. Uh, uh, data set. And, and the deal was that anything that uh, Evren acquires, Yamana will have uh, 60 days to elect to farm into it on fixed terms. And the terms are uh, a million bucks over uh, two years and then delivering a pre-feasibility study within a total of 10 years. Now, delivering a pre-feasibility study in Nevada can be very expensive, and, and that would net Yamana 75%, and Evram would keep uh, 25%. And it's because of the expense of a PFS in Nevada, I like the deals that have that provision. But what I don't like is the 10-year timeline. Uh, uh, investors and juniors really don't have that much time to, to really wait for it. But the deal also allows that if you drop below 10% because you're not bothering to contribute uh, your, your 25% share, in this case, Evren would revert to a 2.5% NSR, which Yamana can buy down half to 1.25% uh, for a U.S. $5 million payment, which is a fairly substantial payment. So what I think will happen is when this merger is complete, Evren technically has acquired all of Rengold's uh, Nevada prospects, and uh, Yamana will have 60 days to decide which ones of these it uh, is going to, you know, spend a million bucks on over the next uh, couple of years and poke around and see what's there. And uh, it becomes, they all become potentially uh, these uh, one and a quarter percent uh, uh, royalty companies. 
So the company's a future in Nevada. Even anything new that Bob Felder's team will come up with, and this and this alliance is uh, in place until October 2021. It will probably have to be offered to uh, Yamana on those same terms. So I don't know how much uh, effort will go into generating new prospects to flood Yamana Yamana with these decisions to be made. But by changing the company into a royalty company, it becomes very similar to Ely Royalties, which used to be this uh, 10 to 20 cent uh, bottom fish company that uh, with Jerry Backman's uh, work assembled all these prospects uh, uh, that weren't really uh, you know ounces in the ground that were worth developing but were very interesting exploration plays. And lately the uh, whole royalty concept has gained a lot of traction. There are many companies going public uh, and Eli is now in the dollar fifty to two dollar range. But Orogen, because it continues to both in the Evren Patty Nickel Department and in Bob Felder's Nevada Department, uh, are continuing to develop prospects from scratch with this idea of eventually we end up with a 1% to 2% uh, royalty. Uh, that's going to be different from, say, a company buying royalties in existing projects elsewhere. So it's a pure prospect generator royalty type company that's in the making. Uh, the biggest shareholder will end up being Altius, uh, which uh, was one of the original Al- royalty companies. It also started as a prospect generator farm out entity, and uh, it owns shares in both companies. And it happens to own a 1.5% NSR in the Silicon Project. And probably one of the worst deals poor Bob Felder did was selling or optioning the Silicon Project uh, to Anglo Gold for a $3 million U.S. payment. Last month, they got the last $2.4 million payment. Uh, so Angle Gold now owns 100%, uh, and uh, Renaissance Gold got to receive a 1% NSR. Uh, LTS is now more focused on industrial and base metal royalties, so it might be interesting to see what happens uh, in terms of turning Orogen royalties into a gold focused royalty companies continuing in the prospect generator uh, uh, tradition. We'll have more with John Kaiser right after this. Media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, recycling trade publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Avon Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia and the Yukon. Trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the OTCQB, symbol ABNAF. Surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines, Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with John Kaiser. John, whatever happened to the Los Chapitos copper discovery of Camino Minerals? Camino became a discovery watch story in April 2017 when they intersected 106 meters of 1.3% copper at the Los Chapitos project in southern Peru. The hope at the time was that it would become another Mina Justa deposit, which is to the north, and that was 346 million tons of 0.71% copper. This is not in the porphyry style of mineralization. It's more of the IOCG style of mineralization, except without the, the gold component. The drilling was focused on the four-kilometer uh, diva trend, where there's lots of you know, quite high-grade outcropping copper mineralization. And the hopes were that we would get the substantial widths that could become open pitable deposit and then chase it down dip, down plunge, and end up uh, getting even higher grade that could be lend itself to um, uh, um, a blockading type underground operation. But as they got deeper in that, the grades did not get better, the widths did not get thicker, and it started to uh, look uh, not as uh, 
promising as it did in the beginning. And in August 2018, Ken McNaughton, who is the, the CEO, the person running this company and the driving force behind the exploration strategy, he suddenly resigned as CEO. Uh, John Williamson's group came in and, and took John, and Ken had to disappear back to Predium Resources to help them find the uh, ounces in the Valley of the King's High, High Grade Play, which was uh, running running into problems uh, meeting the uh, grade expectations in the resource, es- resource estimates. So Ken ended up being sidetracked. Uh, John Williamson's group, uh, they looked at all the work, came up with a brand new uh, drill program. Uh, the, the earlier one had pretty much chased the zones down plunge until they disappeared. So they were really chasing chasing high-grade copper mineralization that wasn't really geared to delineating a resource. Williamson's group put together a big plan, but it wasn't really their company. They were more like caretakers of it, uh, so no drilling was actually done to revive this project. Well, in January, uh, uh, Jay Shemaloskis and Keith Peck took on the roles of CEO and chairman, and John Williamson resigned. They had spent 2019 uh, investigating 35 copper projects. Uh, they are both of the uh, view that uh, uh, long-term copper driven by renewable energy demand is going to be a strong metal, and they wanted to build a company that was copper-focused. Keith Peck had been involved with a Centennial, Centennial Copper Corp, which uh, had the Frank deposit in Chile, and that was... Uh, something similar to what might be at Los Chapitos. Uh, It had about uh, 80 million tons of uh, 0.71% copper that was amenable to SXEW processing, which means it's it's oxide copper. And it was bought by Quadra in April 2009 for only $88 million worth of stock. That was a quarter of what the The company was priced at in late 2007 before the financial crisis hit, and it got bought out basically at the bottom. So Keith has his experience with that process. In the case of Los Chapitos, what they are seeing in the diva trend is, okay, we can go down to 250, 300 meters of uh, of depth for open pitting. Uh, there's all the work done in the past shows metallurgically. There's about 0.6% or so soluble copper that uh, is recoverable through SXEW. So what they would like to do is establish at least a minimum 25 million tons of uh, open pitable copper, ideally with a minimum grade of 0.6%. And the foot tonnage footprint be beneath the Adriana target, uh, which is at the north end of the uh, the, the, the four kilometer Diva trend. Uh, it's uh, it has about a footprint for that potential. They would like to do a 5,000 meter drill program to go in there and stitch this all together, so that at least internally they can do a resource estimate for their own satisfaction. That yes, worst case scenario. We have a small-scale SXEW uh, potential, but this trend goes all the way down to the Vicky target, which is four kilometers away. In the middle is the Caddy target. They're also going to be drilling some holes between Vicky, a bit between Adriana and Caddy. And to help them, they're going to do a hyperspectral uh, survey, which uh, uh, it looks at the reflectivity of of the uh, of the Earth. It's done by satellite, and it's used to see alteration patterns, and the, the theory is that where there are cross structures in this uh, uh, diva trend, that's likely where there is more alteration, where there is more copper, so they hope to see, you know, beyond what they can do by physically prospecting and, and mapping this trend, hope to see hot spots of higher grade uh, mineralization and maybe develop a number of such, uh, you know, 15 to 25 million ton open pits potential along that trend. At the same time, they also want to shoot for the moon. They plan to do a a, a magnetotelluric uh, survey, which can see down to 300 to 1,000 meter depth. Uh, Only a few holes have really gone below that, chasing the Adriana zone. The hope here is that the MT survey will show a substantial target at depth uh, 
which uh, will probably be, be sulfides rather than oxides, but could be a completely different sort of game changer for this Los Chapito story. And this survey will also be done in the fall when they hope to uh, begin this 5,000-meter drill program. They've got the permits for 160 locations to do all that drilling. Uh, uh, Jay and Keith, uh, Jay, Jay was actually involved with the developing the Xinjiang Gold uh, mine in China when, when Robert Friedland uh, was in charge of that. Uh, and Keith has been involved in various fundraising uh, aspects of the industry. Uh, they both participated in a financing of 7.5 million units at uh, 8 cents in January. That cleaned up existing debts, and there's about 200,000 working capital in the company. They're now going to work to try and raise uh, up to $3 million to advance this program, which they hope to be able to begin in September. Uh, Peru is still in pretty much a lockdown area. Uh, they can use uh, a Peruvian geologist to get the, the summer work started, and the hope is that by the fall uh, it will be much, much, much easier to get exploration work done in Peru. So Los Chapitos seem to have faded away as a... Uh, Worthless science project, a good effort, and good grades, but not enough to actually make a mine. But now Jay Shemaloskas and Keith Peck are taking this on with a two-stage project of showing that uh, there's open pitable resource of 25 million to 100 million ton potential plus deeper blue sky potential of much bigger tonnage potential. So it's interesting for bottom fishers to see this story revived, and it's once again something that uh, uh, is worth Discovery Watch audiences to pay attention to. John, thank you so much for the update. You're welcome, Jim. We've been speaking with John Kaiser, his website, kaiserresearch.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Comments made on Discovery Watch are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at HowStreet.com. Discovery Watch is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.